<clears throat> Anyone have a song? Yeah, come on up. Did you find it? Good deal. I went back there and looked, couldn't see any, so I'm glad you found it. <laughs> you can find just about anything you're looking for on here. And now I just lost it. <laughs> okay. All right. I was thinking about this song today after Brother Billy was preaching, and I thought I'd sing it for him tonight. Well, not just for him, but for everyone. Amen. <clears throat> One of my favorite um, missionary hymns <clears throat> goes like this. There's four verses and four choruses, so I'm going to break it down and just do two chorus. Two chorus. <clears throat> it goes like this. It's to the regions beyond. <clears throat> to the regions beyond, I must go, I must go, where the story has never been heard. To the millions that never have heard of his love, I must tell the sweet story of old. To the hardest of places he calls me to go, never thinking of comfort or ease. The world may pronounce me a dreamer, a fool, enough if the master I please. Yes, to the regions beyond, I must go, I must go, till the world, all the world, his salvation shall know. Amen. Oh, you that are spending your leisure and powers, in those pleasures so foolish and fond. Awake from your selfishness, folly, and sin, and go to the regions beyond. There are other lost sheep that the Master must bring, and to them must the message be told. He sends me to gather them out of all lands and welcome them back to his fold. To the regions beyond, I must go, I must go, till the world, all the world, his salvation shall know. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. That, was a, that was a blessing. I enjoyed that, brother. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> we're going to concentrate in chapter 5, but we're going to begin in chapter 4. <clears throat> few things you have to keep in your mind when you're looking at prophecy in the Bible, when you're looking at, at prophetic events. Paul came and he revealed a mystery. A mystery was something that was not known in the Old Testament, but now he has revealed it in the New Testament. He's revealed it concerning the church. The mystery is that before the day of the Lord comes, and by the way, the day of the Lord is just not one 24-hour period. It's a process of things during the tribulation time and then Christ establishing his kingdom. It's a day in which the Lord will have his way. The, uh, you know, we, he, we've been letting, uh, he, God's been letting, permitting Satan to do certain things upon this earth. And... Uh, Satan has to give an account, we know from the book of Job, to God, but yet he's still allowed and permitted to do certain things at this point in time. 
The day of the Lord comes when the Lord's going to bring his day in. And he's going to get some things done to take it back. Everything sin lost is going to be taken back through Christ. And so Christ is, we know through the, uh, through the Bible that, and even the Old Testament had foresaw a time of tribulation and great trouble for Israel. But what Paul reveals to us, and, and he reveals it and deals with the church of Thessalonica, is the fact that there would be a catching away of saints before, because the church, the saints, are not appointed to wrath. The time of, of, of the tribulation is not for the church. It's not for the saints that are alive during that time. It is for Israel and for those that have not heard the gospel in the regions beyond as the 144,000 takes the gospel of the kingdom and preaches it among across the world. And then, of course, at the end of it is when Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom. And so you have to keep those things in mind when you read of the day of the Lord. You have to understand those concepts of it. Begin reading, if you would, in verse number 13 of chapter 4. And then we're going to get in chapter 5 and look at a few verses there. Verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now we pointed out several times in several ways, this sleep is not for the soul. If you look in Revelation chapter 6, verse number 9, you'll find that the soul does not sleep in heaven. It's the body sleep. In other words, those whose body is laid on the ground, laid in the ground, buried, is asleep. The soul is alive and present with Jesus in heaven and waiting for him to come back. And so Paul wants the brethren to know, wants us to know, and not be ignorant about those who have died since Christ resurrected. When Christ resurrected, according to Matthew chapter 25, verses 50 through 53, there was a resurrection then. He was the first fruits, and he took some others with him. He went down into hell, and of course we know Abraham's bosom was there, and he led captivity captive out of there. The Bible tells us in Matthew 25, verses 50 through 53, that there was graves that burst open, and many of the saints that slept at that time arose. And so we find that that was the first stage of the first resurrection of the Old Testament saints. Then since then, everyone who has died to be absent from the body is not go to Abraham's bosom, but is to go up in paradise to the third heaven. And they are present with the Lord. And they have been waiting this time for Jesus to come back. And so Paul wants everybody not to be ignorant concerning those who are saved and what the process will be. He says in verse number 13 again, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Again, the gospel is the only hope of our salvation. It's believing in the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's always been that since Jesus died, and it'll always be that. Uh, I don't care what we try to do, we cannot change the source of salvation. It is still through the foolishness of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people have to believe in their heart that God has done this to his son and uh, has made a way for us to be saved. Look in verse uh, uh, 14 again. The Bible says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say, uh, 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 this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, the, the thing that we call, we refer to as a rapture, involves Jesus. It involves those saints that have gone on in the Lord that's been saved. And also it involves the saints that are alive on the earth at that time. At that time when Jesus comes, he will come in the air. There will be a shout. There will be a trump. There will be the power of the resurrection. Uh, the dead in Christ will rise and get their glorified bodies and be renewed with their souls. And then we which are alive and remain shall be changed. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 and 51, we shall be changed in the twinkle of an eye, quicker than a blink. We will be changed that fast, and we will be in heaven. And so the power of the resurrection also comes the power of this catching away, uh, snatching away. It will just be that quick. When it comes time, and only God knows, when that day and hour comes, all of a sudden, there will be no forewarning. There will be a shout. There will be a, a trump. And we will all be sn uh, snatched away that quick. Now, how God performs it and what God does, we don't know. But we also know from Scripture that he will send strong delusion upon those who have refused to believe the truth uh, here upon this earth. Now, not only that, but we also see the power to rescue those of us who are alive there will be a great reunion with our loved ones that have been saved. And there will be a revelation of Jesus. We will see him as he is. And when we see him, we will be like him. And we're thankful for that. And so from that point on, wherever you find Jesus in the prophetic uh, plan of God, you will find us because we will forever be with the Lord. So wherever he is, if he's going through the judgment seat of Christ, we'll be there. If he's going to marriage, we will be there. If he's coming back, we will be there. When he's reigning on the earth, we will be there. When he's judging the great white throne judgment, we will be there. Amen. And when he enters into the new heaven, new earth, we will be there. And we will forever be with the Lord uh, from that point on. Look, if you would, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Now the times is the duration of the period that we're waiting on. And the, and the seasons is the characteristics that will happen. Uh, Paul deals with some of those over in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3 about the perilous times that will come in the last days and things and how people will change. But he says that we have no, he have no need that we write unto us. And he says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. In other words, it's going to come and those that's not looking for it are not going to be prepared and not going to be ready for it. It says in verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon the woman with child, and they shall not escape. In other words, it's, as travail with a child, it is, it is uh, determined to happen, but nobody knows a moment when it's going to happen. But when it happens, it's going to bring great destruction uh, upon those who are left behind. And it's going to be a terrible time when that time comes. Now, verse number four is where I want to pick up at, and I want to preach upon it in just a few verses down below it. He says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, uh, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you ought to thank God for that verse number 9. Uh, we don't have to. You know, uh, I've had people uh, worried to death about things. I've had them come in my office before and, and be scared about something being the mark of the beast. Uh, the mark of the beast is the least of my worries. And you know why? Because it's not appointed me to go through that time of wrath. I will not be faced with the mark of the beast. 
Amen. And I'll be glad that I'm not going to be here when he sits upon his throne. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I don't have to experience those things because God hasn't appointed me to that because of what Jesus has done. Amen. Look in verse 10. Who died for us, uh, that rather we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, what chapter 5 is warning is he's warning that as the day approaches, we as God's people will begin, if we're not careful, to catch ourselves sleeping. The Bible teaches us in the progression of the church age that the church of Laodicea follows the church of Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia is one that the church has had great charity. As Brother Eric was singing the song uh, earlier, going to the regions beyond, the church age of Philadelphia was one in which missions uh, was burdens of many churches. We were sending them out. We were starting churches, establishing churches. We were seeing people saved. I remember here, I've seen as many as 10 people saved in one service. Just don't see that much no more. I remember going for months without seeing, uh, having a service, without someone walking the aisle and being saved. Don't see that much anymore. And you just hardly see people getting saved anymore. And so what we've done is we have turned, and, and we, 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 uh, uh, it's not that God's not in the saving business, but things are changing. The church is changing. It is transforming over into the Laodicea period where we are so comfortable in our churches that we think we have need of nothing. And we don't realize how poor and wretched and blind we really are. And as we preach this morning, we've lost the, uh, the vision. And because of the loss of vision, people are perishing. But the Bible tells us here that we, we need to be careful and not fall in that trap. Because as we get to, to the time, we're going to see people changing. And sure enough, we've seen the people changing. Those of us who are saved, we have seen prophetic things happening in the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, look at the families, look at children, look at the church, look at the times, look at the politics, look at everything around us. Everything is pointing to Jesus coming. And so therefore, what we need to realize is this. He points out that there are two groups of people, children of light and day versus children of night and darkness. The amazing thing is we both live at the exact same time, but we both live in different worlds. The lost does not see the world like I see it. The lost does not see the time as I see it. The lost does not rejoice on things that I rejoice on. I weep usually when they're rejoicing. And when I'm rejoicing, they're weeping. And so therefore I find myself at odds and I find myself being a child of light, being a child of day, I live at the same exact time as they do, but I live in a different world than they do. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And so therefore, when I get into this and we look at this, the, uh, the, the word day means that we have been warmed. We have the light. We've been illuminated. In other words, we have a vision. We're able to see things in a different perspective than we did before we were saved. And when we become saved, because Jesus is the light, then that light has come into us and the Holy Ghost of God has begun to teach us and reveal to us things that we did not realize before. And therefore, we look, we look at things differently. That's why Peter talks about suffering as a Christian. Not only will you suffer by receiving persecution sometimes, but you also suffer by the way that you grieve. We grieve over things that the world does not even grieve about. They don't lose any sleep at all. It grieves my soul. 
You know, I can go to I can go to a funeral. And sometimes some of the funerals just grieves my soul. They have no testimony of being saved. They have no uh, experience of being saved. They have no time and place that they were ever saved. Yet it grieves my soul that they come and they're able to rejoice at the death of someone who went to hell. And they're so ignorant that they don't even see the truth in that. I remember one, one uh, uh, funeral I was preaching, and I was preaching, and I mentioned hell, and I was preaching about hell, those people who are lost. I remember this guy, he was about 50 years old. He was looking at me, I could tell he was getting mad and madder at the minute. And finally he got right up in the middle of the message and he walked out, all mad, storming. He made a, he made a, uh, he made a point to let everybody see that he was upset when he left. But you know, he left because of truth. But see, he didn't see things because he was in the dark. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that Satan has blinded their mind. Unless the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ comes in and reveals to them truth, they're going to die. And so therefore, what we need to understand is, if we are children of light and day, we handle this time differently than what other people handles it. We are not caught by surprise that Jesus is coming. When he comes, those in darkness will not even know he come. They don't even see him coming. They don't have a clue that he's coming. They're not even looking for him. He's like a thief in the night. But not us. I've been looking for him to come all the time. And, the, and the, every day that goes, another year clicks on, I'm thinking myself, I've already begun to think, will we finish out 2020 without Jesus coming? Is 2021 the day, year he's coming? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, the prophetic, uh, the prophetic calendar just keeps flipping. The characteristics of the, of the day is happening. The duration is getting closer and closer to the time in which he will come, and there'll be a shout, and all of a sudden the power of the resurrection happens, and we disappear because we are children of day. Children of night, turn things away. They twist things. The Bible teaches in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that at this time there would come a falling away. They will reject truth. They don't want to hear truth. You know, it's amazing me. I don't know about you, but I, all I have to do is be grieved is turn my TV on and watch some of these religious programs. And it grieves my spirit and soul. And when I watch... They've determined that they, the, the way to, to reach the world is to be like the world. The Bible teaches no such thing. And also, so therefore, what we need to understand is there is a separation that God makes between day and light and darkness and night. And they are children of darkness. Now, if you look in Matthew chapter 4, keep your finger there a moment, and look in Matthew chapter 4 a moment, and those here, in verse number 16, the Bible says, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. To them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Look, if you would, in John chapter number 3. In John chapter number 3. We know the Bible says in John chapter 1, as Brother Eric taught in Sunday school the other day, that Jesus was that true light. And, and he was the light that would come to the world. But in chapter 3, he reveals something, that people who are in darkness are in darkness by choice. They choose to be in darkness. The light has come. The light is available. But they have rejected the light, and spiritual darkness is their choice. In other words, they've turned the light off. They flipped the switch. They, they, want, uh, they want to uh, live in darkness. Notice verse number 19. And this is a condemnation that light has come into the world, 
And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Somebody says, what does that mean? That means repentance. And by the way, I get tired of these people trying to preach salvation without repentance. The Bible says there was a time when it, man's ignorance God winked at. But now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And I, I get this all the time about homosexual groups. And people said, well, preacher, I believe that they can be saved because Jesus said this over here. Well, look what he said right here. What he teaches is this. Yes, they might be saved, but they don't get saved without coming and turning from their lifestyle, turning from their wicked ways. God does not save them in that to remain in that. He saves them out of that if they are saved. They are rescued from the sin that has damned their soul. And so therefore, the Bible says, For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So what they've done is they've turned around and they've tried to, to politically correct the churches to the point where you, where you can't preach about it no more, you can't preach against it anymore, you can't stand against it anymore, and what they've done is the, this bunch of liberal uh, churches have swung over and it's made it acceptable, but God's word has never made it so. And so therefore when they come to the light, their deeds has to be reproved. Verse 21, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Any of us, when we get saved, what happened to the Holy Ghost of God convicted us of sin. Not only did he draw us, not only did he point us to Jesus, but he convicted us of sin and made us guilty before God. We didn't look and blame everybody else. We looked inside and said, this is me. He shed the light come, and it shed light upon who we were. And listen, even today, being a child of light, God continues to shed light on me. And I see myself, and when I see myself, I feel much like Paul. I'm the least. I'm the least. Uh, and and I, uh, when I look at myself, I see myself uh, before God as so unworthy. But that's because I have the light. I see it. And so the Bible says that this darkness is something that they choose, and they turn that light. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What are we to do, we children of light? Well, look, if you would, back in the Bible and notice. He says in verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, we'll get back to that in just a moment. Uh, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunk are drunken in the night. Now, first of all, let's look at, at the Bible talks about being sleeping. In other words, we have our eyes closed, spiritual eyes are closed, to what's going on. The Bible says that we that are children of light, we need to have our eyes wide open. We need to be aware of what's taking place. We don't, need to be, we don't need to be put to sleep in this world, running to and fro, and taking our eyes off of the prophetic time in which we are living. We need to be looking around. The Bible says here that the God of this world has blinded those who are lost, and so they are ignorant to what's going on. We see the world through the glorious light of the scriptures and so when I look at Israel I don't look at Israel for Israel I look at Israel for through Abraham through the scriptures through the promises and so therefore what we do is we see with different eyes now knows the Bible says that we're to keep our spiritual eyes open and not sleep as others do and sleeping is a sign of not being aware of your surroundings. 
How many times has something happened while you slept? You ever had something happen when you slept? Well, uh, uh, Beth had called me today, and I hadn't changed my phone to off silent, and I was asleep. I woke up and saw Chris had told me that she had tried to call me. Well, neither one of them got through because I was asleep. I was unaware that anything was going on around me. And, uh, and so what happens is the same thing happens to us as Christians. God does not want us to sleep during this time where we are not aware of what's happening around us. He has given us enough signs. And by the way, Jesus was critical with the religious leaders of his time because they did not know the times and the seasons. And we are to know the times and the seasons and be aware of that. Know that, but it should also encourage us. Listen, if you've got children that's not saved, you ought to have a burden. If you've got family that's not saved, you ought to have a burden got neighbors I've got neighbors that don't go to church anywhere and there there's good gold to me but they don't go to church anywhere don't have an interest in coming to church we need to have a burden not only should we keep our eyes open but also the Bible says that in verse 6 that we should watch and be sober and we should not be drunken because they are drunken in the night now, to be drunken, what, that, what we do is, when you get drunk, you escape from reality. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, uh, years ago, uh, I used to drink. I know Brother Eric's talking about the other day, he gave his testimony that, that he experienced some of those things too. But you know, what I found myself was doing is, I would use that to escape from reality. When I would sober up, Guess what? Not only did I still have the same problems I had, but now I've got more problems. Because most of the time I've created more problems on top of what I've done. Uh, a time or two, I woke up with bruises all over me, and Chris wore up and down. She did not use a frying pan on me. I don't know why she, why the frying pan was, was uh, come to her mind real quick, but I know that uh, I didn't have the bruises before I went to sleep. But anyway, getting on beyond that, let me say this, all jokes aside, they, there's more problems and complications. And what's happening is this, people of darkness and night, they're escaping the reality of hell. They're escaping the reality and the thoughts they don't want to be thinking. Why can't you get them to come to church? You know why? I, I've had some... I had some people come one time. I invited uh, some guys that worked for me, and, and the one guy come, and he told me later on, he said, I can't stand you preaching on hell. And right now you couldn't give him in church for nothing, and he don't want to hear about it. But the sad part about it is that's where he's going. But the reason why he don't, I said, why don't you like to hear about it? He said, I don't want to even think about it. I said, do you realize if you don't think about it, one of these days you'll wake up and you'll be there? And so therefore what you do is you try to escape from the reality that it exists. And so what happens when people are, are living in drunkenness and they're living in a drug phase and they're living in things, they're trying to escape from the reality of life. And the Bible says we are to be sober. The word sober means not only not drunk, but it means to be serious. To take a serious look and understand that this time in which we're living, listen, let me ask you this. What if Jesus came this very moment? Think about this. Number one, are you sitting here and would you be left behind? Do you understand how serious that is? You would be damned. Believe a lie. You would follow the Antichrist. You would take his mark. You'd be cast into hell with the devil and his angels. Do you understand that if you died, the seriousness of it? Also those of us who are saved. Do we understand the soberness of this moment in which we live 
if this was the night that Jesus came, who do we know that would be left? Therefore, we need to be sober. The Bible says that we're to be vigilant, be sober for our adversary, the devil. He roams as a roaring lion. Not only that, but look on in your Bibles. Look in verse number 8. And let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. In other words, uh, to protect our heart, the faith and love that we have in our life. Uh, the world wants to battle those things in our life. And so therefore what we do is the Bible teaches us that we are, we are to uh, uh, protect our heart. In, in Psalms, keep your finger there, in Psalms 57, in Psalms chapter 57, David puts it this way. Get over a moment. In verse 7, he said, My heart is fixed. O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and praise thee. In other words, the Bible says we're not to be anxious during this time. We're not to be, uh, but what we're doing is through our prayers and supplications, we're to find the peace of God in our hearts. And what we have to do is we have to keep our hearts. We have to keep our eyes. We have to keep our minds. We have to keep our hearts. And last but not least, we also keep our hope. Look, if you would, in verse 8. Breastplate of faith and love, and a hel for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now we have a hope. The Bible calls it a blessed hope. I'm going through this life, and somebody said, what are you do going to be doing 20 years from now? I don't expect to be here 20 years from now. I don't expect the church to be here 20 years from now. Now it might be, I don't know, but I don't expect it to be. But I have a blessed hope. In the book of Titus, if you notice in Titus chapter number 2 real quickly, Paul wrote this in verse number 13. Our blessed hope, and by the way, your blessed hope is not that there is a God. You ought to know there's a God. Your blessed hope is not hoping you are saved. You ought to know that you're saved. Your blessed hope is not the fact that you, you, uh, you hope you're going to heaven. You ought to know you're going to heaven. Your blessed hope is this. Look in verse 13. He says, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, the Bible teaches us that we that are children of day and light, we have this blessed hope. We have three gifts God gives us. Faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. But we have faith, hope, and charity. And here Paul says we are to protect them during a the time in which we live. And so therefore we protect them by keeping our eyes awake and alert where we see what's going on. Keeping our minds alert and sober, realizing the seriousness of the time. And also keeping our hearts and realizing that, that, that uh, our hearts got to be fixed upon the things of God. Because the devil's going to do everything in the world to try to discourage. And look at the last part, and then we're going to close right here. He says in verse number 10, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should uh, live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. I've had people say, Preacher, what do you think I ought to be doing? Well, I'm honest with you, and some people don't like my answer, but I'm honest with you. Verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had to miss church for a period of time? Or how many of you have missed church for a period of time? How many of you found yourself getting cold and indifferent? How quick did it take you to become cold and indifferent? 
I worry about these people that's not been in church for months and months. Somebody said, I watch it. I think there's only so much you can get from watching it. I think coming together encourages me. In other words, some songs I've heard today, some testimonies, some lessons. Your, uh, uh, your illustration this morning using the negatives. All those things are things that encourage me. They bless me. And the Bible teaches that we are to come together even so much more as we see the day approaching. I believe this devil has used this as an occasion to give people an excuse for not coming. Now I understand sometimes people can't come. I understand that. But I also understand this. It's awfully easy to be rocked to sleep. It's awful easy to go to sleep when you're not coming to the house of God. It's awful easy not to be sober and to lose sight of what's going on. And besides that, it's awful easy to have your heart where you are anxious and worried. People will tell me sometimes, I talk to them, they say, Preacher, I'm just, I'm just scared to death. And I think to myself, why don't you come to the house of God? That might ease some of your worry. Now, I know that there are some people, I know some people are sick. Some people are very, uh, uh, are very apt in, in a lot of things uh, uh, in, in this time in which we live. But then there's others that seems to have no desire. They don't seem to miss the house of God. And they've absolutely put themselves to sleep. And you know the sad part about it is? I look at their families. And their families are drifting apart. And drifting away. Dangerous time. You don't take the devil much. To destroy people during this time. And so therefore. I'm glad. That I am in the world. But not of the world. I am the child, I am a child of light and of day. And even though I live in the same world, it's two different worlds. And the way in which I see things, amen. Let's stand tonight. Give a song, brother.